Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is part two of the Microbiome Analysis Methods lecture series. In the last lecture, we talked about alpha diversity as measures of within-sample within diversity. Um, specifically, we talked about observed features and phylogenetic diversity as measures of microbiome richness. Today, we're going to talk about beta diversity metrics. Beta diversity metrics differ from alpha diversity metrics in that they are computed on pairs of samples and they typically are representing between sample diversity metrics. Most commonly, beta diversity metrics are used to compare the composition of a pair of microbiome samples based on what organisms are present in each of those samples. If we move over to a slide similar to uh, the one that we used when we started our alpha diversity lecture series, um, you'll see that this pair I use to represent beta diversity. And so again, we have two gardens in these photos. The garden on the left and the garden on the right look like they might have about the same number of types of plants in them, roughly, but the composition of the plants in these two gardens are very different. And so on the left, we have what looks like it um, might be more of a vegetable garden. I, I at least think I see some vegetables in there. While over on the right, we have a flower garden. And so both of these have relatively high richness, um, especially relative to the um, field of yellow tulips that we contrasted um, the flower garden here with in our last lecture. Um, so relatively high richness, but very different composition. So if we were to um, compute a distance between these samples based on their, their uh, flower composition, flower species composition, um, which is something that we would often do with a beta diversity metric, we would probably find that these have a relatively high distance or dissimilarity between a pair of samples. Now, when we compute beta diversity, I mentioned we do this between pairs of samples, and we typically do this by measuring in one way or another the distance between a pair of samples. We often will not just focus on one pair of samples, but we will typically compute this for all pairs of samples in our analysis. And that lets us start to explore the similarity or the differences between the different uh, uh, samples in our analysis. In this lecture, we're going to talk about three specific distance measures that are often used in microbiome research, and we will uh, use these three to explore three different ways of looking at community dissimilarity or community distance, and we'll talk about what is similar and what is different across these pairs of metrics, or across these three metrics that we're going to look at. The first metric that we're going to look at is one that's called the Jacquard distance. And this is a, met a method that um, more or less comes out of uh, set theory. Um, it's at least very useful to think about set theory as you're uh, working with this metric. Um, and what this is, it is, is the fraction of features that are only observed in one of two samples. And then that fraction is divided by the, the features that are observed in either one of the samples. And so you can think of this as um, roughly what is the uh, intersection of these two sets. And so um, if you think of our, say, like a sample, a red sample and a blue sample as our two samples here, on the left, if most of the same features are present in both the red sample and the blue sample, they're going to have a large intersection. And so they'll have a distance that is close to zero. So they, since they're almost identical to each other, their distance is very close to zero. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, so if we were to come over and look at this example over here on the right, when there are relatively few features in common between the pair of samples, so again, between our red and our blue sample, uh, 
then the, uh, the intersection is small. And so we would end up having a large distance between the pair of samples. And so if they have very little overlap, then they're very dissimilar from one another. And then if they are somewhere in the middle, um, so maybe they have half of their features in common and then each has um, half of their features unique to that sample, then maybe they would end up with a jacquard distance somewhere around the middle. So let's actually try and compute this for a couple of samples. So here I have an example feature table that we can work with for uh, some of the analyses that we're going to do in this section. And I have the formula for Jacquard distance written out here. Um, so first, let's just talk about this formula because the notation here might not be familiar to you. Um, so the, there's a couple of symbols in here um, that I want to um, bring your attention to. Um, and so the um, sort of upside down U symbol, this one here, um, that is not an N, even though it kind of looks like an N, um, is the intersection. Oops, I don't know what I was writing there. Um, the opposite of that, the sort of uh, the U looking symbol is the union. Um, and then these bars on the side don't mean absolute value in this case, but they mean size of. Um, and so this again all comes from set theory. Um, but in this case, so like if we are computing this between two sets A and B, those are going to represent the samples that we're working with. Um, and so what this means, so like what an intersection would mean is which samples are sorry, which features are in common between these two sets or these two samples that we're looking at. So let's start by computing the Jacquard distance between um, sample four AC two and the sample E375. And so what this formula would then look like would be and then I can't forget the one minus and so this might initially seem um, a little intimidating, especially if you haven't seen this notation before, um, but I assure you this is very straightforward and you will easily be able to compute this pretty quickly. So the intersection of 4AC2 and E375 uh, is all of the features that are shared between both of those samples. And so the intersection, um, how about I do the intersections in blue? Um, and so the intersection, so these two are both in, are in both of the samples, or sorry, this, uh, so feature one is in both of the samples, feature three is in both of the samples, and feature four is in both of the samples. And so if we're computing the size of that intersection, we would end up with one minus three in the numerator. And so this is just going to be the count of features that are observed in both samples. And then the, the union of these, I'll do the union in red. The union is going to be the features that are observed in either or both of the samples. And so that would include feature one, feature two, feature three, feature four, and feature five. And so we would end up with five in the denominator and our Jacquard distance would therefore be one minus 0.6 which is going to be 
And so that is the distance, the Jacquard distance, between samples 4, AC2, oops, um, 4, AC2, and E375. Um, okay, so let's do this for another sample now. Um, let's do this for, let's say for those bottom two samples here. So we'll do 4GD8 and 9872. And so the um, intersection, the numerator here, um, the intersection of these would be feature 3 and feature 4. And the union of these would be feature 1, feature 2, feature 3, and feature 4. And so when we compute our Jacquard index, um, this would be, again, um, we'll call this, or sorry, Jacquard distance. That is going to be equal to 1 minus the size of the intersection of 4GD8 intersected with 9872 over the union of those two samples. So that is going to be 1 minus and we our intersections again we're in red and so we have 2 over our unions which are in blue which is 4 and so this of course will be 0 0.5. So when we start computing Jacquard distances um, like I said, we typically are going to want to compute this for all pairs of samples in our analysis. And so when we do that, we build a new data structure up called a distance matrix. And I have uh, com uh, computed, or sorry, I have created a blank distance matrix over on the bottom right of this slide. And we can use this to fill in the values that we compute. Um, now, we just computed a few of these, um, but let me, um, before we fill those in, let me just talk about a few other values that we get to fill in for free in a distance matrix. Um, and so the diagonal, which represents always the distance between a sample and itself, is always going to be zero. And if you were to, um, try and convince yourself of this by computing a few of these, um, you would quickly convince yourself that, uh, that this is true. And so, um, for example, if we look at 4AC2, the intersection of 4AC2 and itself is going to be 4, or sorry, the size of the intersection between 4AC2 and itself is going to be 4. It's going to be feature 1 feature 3, feature 4, and feature 5. And then the union is also going to be 4. And so we would end up with 4 over 4, and then 1 minus that would give us 0. Um, and so for any sample that we apply that to, we will end up with a distance of 0. And so you automatically get to fill in, when you're computing a distance matrix, zeros on the diagonal. Um, okay, so we next walked through um, computing a few of these values, and I just went in, went ahead and filled in um, the rest of these. And so we did, in the notebook, 4AC2 and E375, and so that was that value of 0.4 that we came up with at first. Um, and then we did 9872 and E375, and so that's where that um, distance of 0 0.5 that we computed comes up with. I encourage you to take a few minutes and try and compute another few distances from uh, uh, with Jacquard distance and use those to fill in the distance matrix. You can compare to the values that I have in this table to confirm that you're doing it correctly.
Now you'll notice that these values on the top right, or these cells on the top right, are missing values at this point. Um, when you're computing a distance matrix, the other thing that you get to do is you get to compute only the values in one half of the matrix. Distance, uh, distance metrics are symmetric, so you can um, basically like what we're doing here is if you flip the values across the diagonal, they will be identical. Um, and so here you see um, that what this is telling us is like the distance between 4AC2 and E375 is 0 0.4. That is the same as if we looked at 4AC2 as the row and E375 is the column, we would also have 0.4. Similarly, this 0.4 and this 0.4 are the same because they're between the same pair of samples. This 0.5 and this 0.5 are coming from the same pair of samples. This 0 and this 0 are coming from the same pair of samples, and so on. And so the distance matrix is symmetric. Um, and again, if you were to go back and try and convince yourself of why this is the case, and so for example, if you called sample A 4AC2 and sample B E375, you could compute this, and then you could swap those so that E375 was A and 4AC2 was B. If you do that, you'll find that you get the same value regardless of which sample you assign to be A and which sample you assign to be B. If you work through the computation, I think you'll quickly, again, see why that's the case. Um, so that's Chicard distance. Um, and this is what we would call a qualitative non-phylogenetic beta diversity metric. And so, so far, all of the metrics that we have looked at um, in alpha diversity and beta diversity have been qualitative metrics. Qualitative metrics are metrics that don't take into account the abundance values in the feature table, but rather just look at the presence absence of each feature. And so here, we didn't um, we didn't differentiate anywhere in our computation um, if we had a low or a high value of a feature for a given sample. We just looked at whether that value was uh, non-zero, indicating that a feature had been observed in a given sample. Um, now, we did talk about a phylogenetic alpha diversity metric last week. Um, and so you'll remember that that is a metric that uses a phylogenetic tree in its computation. This metric that we just worked with did not use a phylogenetic tree. And so we consider this to be a non-phylogenetic metric. And it's a beta diversity metric because it's working on pairs of samples. Now, the other thing that I wanna do before moving on to a next metric is I wanna talk about some general features of distances that we have um, just sort of touched on in this first example. Um, so when we're computing a distance, and so a distance here is indicated as lowercase d, that distance will always be greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and so that is by definition that a distance cannot have a negative value. Um, next is that um, if we are getting a value of zero for our distance, that means that the two samples that we're comparing are equal to one another. And so if we go back to this previous sample um, or previous example, we can see we did get a distance of zero in here between 4GD8 and E375. So that's these two middle samples here. Now you might look at these and you might think that these don't look identical to one another, but remember that they do according to the, this metric. And so this metric being qualitative only treats each of these as 
um, greater than zero or not. Um, and so these first pair of values would both be greater, they're both greater than zero. And so these feature one would be observed in these two, feature two would be observed in these two, feature three would be observed in these two, and feature four would be observed in these two. And finally, feature five would not be observed in those two. And so as far as this metric is concerned, these samples are equal to one another, and they thus end up with a distance of zero. Um, third relates to that idea of symmetry that we discussed. So the distance between um, sample xi and sample xj is equal to the distance between sample xj and sample xi. This fourth one is a little bit more complicated, and this is known as the triangle inequality. The triangle in inequality says that the distance between two samples, xi and xj, is either going to be less than or equal to the distance of, uh, between xi and xk plus the distance between xk and xj. Um, and so this one um, is a little bit more complicated to think about, but if you think about these as points on a triangle, um, what this is basically saying is that if you have these two points, the distance between them must be less than or equal to the distance of uh, between this, uh, this first point and some other point and then that other point and our second point that we're comparing. So notice xi is here, xj is here, xk you can kind of think of as this intermediary point that you need to connect the two. Um, and so what this is um, more or less saying um, is uh, you can, um, like I said, this is the triangle inequality. This is basically saying that the hypotenuse of the triangle um, must be shorter or equal to the distance of the other two legs of the triangle summed together. Um, so those four axioms are what define a metric as being a distance metric. Um, the fourth one comes up less frequently the first three are all evident in the distance matrix, uh, distance matrices that we're going to be looking at um, in today's class. Okay, so let's look at another metric of distance, and this is the Bray Curtis distance. Um, and so I was trying to find a good way to um, represent this. It's a little bit hard to represent graphically. Um, and this is a slide that a colleague of mine put together on it. Um, and so imagine that um, each of these columns here is a different feature and the boxes represent the counts of that feature. And so like for this first feature, um, we would have a count of four. For the second feature, we would have a count of four. Third feature, a count of four and so on. And then just like before, we have a blue sample and we have a red sample. The Bray Curtis distance is looking at all of the counts that are observed between uh, the two samples. And so that is the denominator of our equation. Uh, and the difference in counts is the numerator of our equation. And so in this case over here, we have the same five features observed the exact same number of times in our two samples. And so we end up with a zero in the numerator and we have a distance of zero between those two samples. Uh, in this ne next example, what we're seeing here is the difference across these two. Um, and so if we were to sum the counts across both of the samples, we would end up with um, eight counts of red and 10 counts of blue. And the 
counts that are not shared across these samples are these little dashed boxes and we have eight of those and so we would end up with a Bray Curtis distance of about 8 over 18 here. Over on the right, we have no shared counts. Um, and then we have 17 counts total. Um, and so we would end up with a distance that is about 1 in this particular case. So this um, this example this slide may or may not be helpful to you in thinking about this um, you can come back to this after you have um, or after we've worked through the formula um, but the formula for this is as follows over on the right so the Bray Curtis distance between two samples a and B is going to be the um, sum of the absolute values of the difference in counts over the sum of the counts. One thing that's confusing about this is that those vertical bars in this case actually do mean absolute value. And so it, with Jacquard, um, that is not what they um, represented. They represented a count. Here it is, those bars represent like the traditional absolute value of some counts. Um, I have created a distance matrix for us to fill values into here, and I have gone ahead and populated the diagonal with zeros in that distance matrix. So let's work through an example of how we would compute this. Okay, so back in our notebook now, I have jotted down this formula, and I'll work through how we compute this. Again, I don't want you to get um, too concerned about this. It might look complicated at first, but it's actually quite straightforward. And so let's focus on the numerator first. And so we're going to compute the Bray Curtis distance between sample 4AC2 and 3, uh, sorry, E375. Now, if we focus on the numerator first, what we're doing is for all features, which are denoted here as lowercase i, we're going to um, we're going to take the distance, or sorry, we're going to um, take the difference in their count, and then we'll get the absolute value of that. And so we're going to sum this for all of our features. And so we're going to have absolute value. And so then for this first one, what we're doing is we are going to get the count of feature I in our sample A. And so our sample A is going to be 4AC2. And so this count is going to be 42. So we'll do 42 minus and then we're going to do the feature count in our sample B, which is 12 in this case. And so we'll have 42 minus 12. And that will be our first pass through this uh, sum function. So we'll then add that to the absolute value of the difference between feature 2 in our two samples. And so that is going to be zero, which is the count in uh, our sample A, minus one, which is the count in our sample B. And so that'll be zero minus one. And we just keep working through these. And so now we are going to be looking at the um, 37 minus 22. And so that is going to be um, feature three in sample in our two samples. So 37 minus 22. And we'll just keep moving through here. So we're now on, on feature four. So we have 99 and 88. So we'll have 99 minus 88. 
plus our values for feature 5, which are 1 and 0. And so plus 1 minus 0. If we work on the denominator now, you can see that this is actually a very similar formula. We're just adding them together now. And so this is where we sum the total counts that we've observed. And so now we would have 42 plus 12. And so I'm getting those from right here. So feature one in sample A is 42. Feature one in sample B is 12. Um, we will then sum zero and one. And those come again from right here. Next, I'll sum 37 and 22, which are going to come from right there. Ninety-nine plus eighty-eight plus one plus zero. And so that ninety-nine and eighty-eight came from right here, and the one and zero came from right here. You've probably also already noticed that these numbers are all going to be the same, and so you don't even really have to refer back to your feature table. You can just sort of copy down what you have above just applying the new formula to it. So summing them rather than subtracting them and summing the absolute values. Um, okay, so I will um, work on simplifying this a little bit. So 42 minus 12, so we have um, 30 plus one plus 15 plus 11 plus 1 um, and it's useful for me to do this in front of the classroom because then people will yell at me if I do something wrong. Um, but let's see, we're going to have 31, 46, 57, 58. And I'm going to get my calculator for this bottom one so I can just check all my work here. So we've got 54 plus 1 plus 59 plus 187 plus 1 equals 302. And I'll just confirm my top values there. 30 plus 1 plus 15 plus 11 plus 1 is 58. So then 58 divided by 302 is going to be rounded 0 0.19. And so that should be the Bray Curtis distance between that first pair of samples. So again, go ahead and compute this for a few other pairs of samples, and then I'll fill the rest of the values into our distance matrix. Okay, so I have now filled in uh, a bunch more values into the distance matrix. You can see that that value that we computed at first, 0 0.19, um, we were correct, and we have that um, in this cell in the matrix, and a few other values uh, representing all other pairs of samples. Like we now know, these metrics are symmetric. Um, you can uh, again, work through the formula backwards, say, for a pair of samples to convince yourself of that. But the reason that this one works is because on the bottom, we're summing the counts. And on the top, we're subtracting the absolute differences. Um, and so, in other words, the absolute value of subtracting those two values. And so, because of that, it doesn't matter whether um, the order of our samples A and B in that formula. And so because this is symmetric, we get to save ourselves a bunch of work.
and we can just reflect those bottom um, that bottom triangle across the diagonal and that'll fill in the, the values in the top part of the matrix. And so now let's just take a minute and try and interpret some of these values. Um, so this is a distance measure. And so what that means is that if a pair of samples have a small distance between them, they're more similar to each other. They're closer to each other in their overall composition. If a pair of samples has a large distance between them, that means that they're more dissimilar to one another. Uh, and so if we use as an example, say this sample 4AC2, um, we can see that it has um, a distance of 0.19 to uh, sample E375. It has a distance of 0.15 to sample 4GD8, and it has a distance of 0.65 to sample 9872. So which of these samples is most similar to 4AC2? And which is more dissimilar to sample 4AC2? You probably realize that the smallest value here, 0.15, is going to be the sample that is most similar to 4AC2. Um, and so that would be these two samples um, in this feature table. Um, you can see that, um, you know, for example, like these counts, 25 is closer to 42 than 12 is, certainly closer than zero is. Um, 23 is closer to 37 than 22 is, and so on. Um, and so these two samples, E375 and 4GD8, are almost as sim are, are, are very similar to one another. In fact, they have a distance between each other of 0 0.07. Those are the two most similar samples in our distance matrix. Um, and they are both fairly similar to 4AC2. E375 is a little bit more dissimilar. Sample 9872 is the most dissimilar to 4AC2. If we look at the vector, the feature vector corresponding to that, you'll see that these do look um, pretty different from one another. Feature 1, for example, which is um, present in relatively high abundance in sample 4AC2, is not present at all in sample 9872. Um, similarly, feature four is present in very high abundance, highest abundance feature in this feature table, um, in sample 4AC2, and it's relatively low in abundance down here. And then the sample which 9872 has in high abundance um, is in a lower abundance in sample 4AC2. And so those are pretty dissimilar samples from one another. You'll also notice that for the first time of the metrics that we've looked at, we're actually using the values that are present, um, the counts that are present in this matrix when we compute a diversity metric. That makes this a quantitative beta diversity metric as opposed to our qualitative metrics, which did not use um, the values, but only the presence absence. Again, we didn't use a phylogenetic tree here, so this is a non-phylogenetic metric, and it's computed on pairs of samples, and so it's a beta diversity metric. Now, you might wonder why we would use qualitative metrics at all when these quantitative metrics exist. And the reason is, is because they tell us different things about our samples. Um, and so a quantitative metric, for example, is going to be more impacted by higher abundance features. Um, and so, for example, like these features with counts of 99 and 98, those could end up dominating a diversity metric that is quantitative. That may or may not be what you want. Another reason why qualitative metrics are commonly used in microbiome research is because we don't always have a, um, we don't 
always have a lot of faith in these counts exactly as we obtain them from our now uh, from a sequencing run. Um, for example, like if some if we have a um, better DNA extraction efficiency for some organisms or if our PCR reaction is more efficient for some of the organisms in our community, then we might see higher counts for those features, even though they're present the same uh, in the same abundance in our sample as something that's obtaining a lower count. Um, and so the quantitative metrics are widely used, but we often we'll look at both quantitative and qualitative metrics at the same time. Now, we haven't yet looked at a phylogenetic beta diversity metric, and so I want to do that next. And the metric that we are going to look at here is called unweighted unifrac. And so unweighted unifrac um, is a qualitative metric, so the unweighted means that we are not looking at the weights of the features um, and uh, in other words the counts of the features in the samples and so what unweighted unifrac is uh, is telling us is what fraction of the branch length in a phylogenetic tree that was observed across both of our samples is unique to either one of the samples and just like we did before, we're going to work through an example on this. Um, and so if we, um, before we get to the example, let's just look at a few cases. And so if we have something like we have over here on the left, where all of the features in the tree are observed in both of our samples, so you can see that all of these are observed in both samples, then there's no unique branch length represented in either of the samples. And so we would have an unweighted unifrac distance of zero between these samples. As far as the, this metric is concerned, this is a pair of identical samples. On the other end of the spectrum, if, for example, we only observe this clade of the tree in our first sample, and we observe this clade of the tree only in our second sample, then as far as this metric is concerned, these samples could not be any more dissimilar to each other than they are. And so we have a unifrac distance of one between these samples. Now, in most cases, we'll be somewhere in the middle where some of the branch length is unique to one of the samples. So like this branch up here, and some of the branch length is observed in both samples, such as this branch and this branch right here. And so in these cases, we'll end up with an unweighted unifrac distance that is somewhere between zero and one. So let's go back to our notebook and look at a example feature table and an example phylogenetic tree, and we will compute some unweighted unifrac distances. Okay, so I've got, again, our example feature table, and because this is a phylogenetic metric, we also need a phylogenetic tree to compute this. And so um, what I'm gonna do here is um, I'm gonna work through um, how we would compute the unweighted unifrac distance. And again, the unweighted unifrac distance is the sum of the unique branch length in a phylogenetic tree and, uh, divided by the sum of the observed branch length. And so what I like to do, this is um, very similar to the FAITH's phylogenetic diversity metric that we talked about in the last lecture. And the way that I compute unifrac is very similar to how I compute FAITH's phylogenetic diversity. So I will, I'm going to compute this for sample 4AC2 and E375 again. And so what I do is I identify which features are observed in 4AC2. And here that is feature 1, 3, 4, and 5. And so what I'll do is on my phylogenetic tree, I am going to trace 
the branches that are observed. Going all the way back to the root node. The root node is right here. There's no branch length associated with it. Um, and so these two that I've highlighted are the branches uh, that are observed because of uh, uh, as a result of feature one being observed in these samples. Now one thing to note is you may wonder why I'm not highlighting this branch or this branch. In a, when we represent a phylogenetic tree in a dendrogram, which is uh, what I have illustrated here, the vertical branches are used only for laying out the tree. They do not have any length associated with them. And so there is, we could highlight that if we wanted to, but there'll be no value that we sum. Um, so next, moving on, so I don't observe feature two. I do observe feature three. And so uh, feature three, I'm going to highlight that branch. I'm going to highlight this branch. This one is already highlighted over here. Um, so I don't need to do anything there. So that means I'm done with feature three. If I move on to feature four, which is observed in this sample, you can see that I'm going to highlight this branch and I'm going to highlight this branch. And then I can move on to feature five, which is observed in this sample. And because feature five is observed, I will highlight that branch. So now let me change my pen color to blue for sample E375, and we'll do the same thing. So feature one is observed in our blue sample, and so I'll draw some blue lines. Feature two is observed, and so I'm going to draw a blue line there a blue line there. I probably should have put my blue line underneath, but I'll leave it um, just for consistency. And then we have a blue line here already, so I don't need to do anything. Um, if I move on to feature three, that is observed. And so I will draw a line there to highlight that. And then all of the other branches for feature three, going back to the root node, are already highlighted. So there's nothing else to highlight there. For feature four, I am going to highlight this branch and highlight this branch. So that covers what I've observed for feature four. And then feature five is not observed, so no additional branches in here. And so the unique branch length in this phylogenetic tree is going to be the branches that have either that are either colored blue or colored orange but not both and so it'll be this branch right here and this branch right here because these are the only branches that are unique to one of our samples here and so the numerator of my equation here whoops wanted to do that in black now. The numerator of my equation here is going to be 0 0.5 plus 0 0.25. And again, that is because this branch here is unique to uh, sample two, my blue sample, so E375, and then this sample here, 0 0.25, is unique to my orange sample for AC2. Now, in the denominator of this equation, we sum up all of the observed branch length, and so that is all of the branches that are orange, blue, or both. And so I will just start um, from the left, top left, and move uh, move on. So I've got 0.1 or 1.25 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.6 plus 0 0.7 
plus 1.45 plus 0 0.75 plus 0 0.25 and so in this case it happened to be all of the branch length in my tree that was observed but that is not always going to be the case um, in fact for some of the other examples here that wouldn't be the case um, okay so I'm going to quickly sum this up on my calculator over 5.8 so then if we have 0.75 divided by 5.8 we are going to have rounded to 0 0.13 so let's jump back to our slides and see if we got that right um, you can see this is sort of illustrated um, what I did in the notebook um, and we do get that value of 0 0.13 now for whatever reason in the slides I don't have that uh, fourth sample in this table so um, this is just a distance matrix relating these three samples to one another um, again, I have uh, put the zeros on the diagonal for us ahead of time. That's easy. We always just get to fill those in with a distance matrix. Um, so I, again, I would encourage you to go ahead and compute this for a few other pairs of samples in this distance matrix, uh, and you can check your work. And so here I've just gone ahead and I have filled in the uh, remaining values in this distance matrix for you. And so you can use these to check your work. Okay, so that is um, three different metrics of beta diversity that are very commonly used in microbiome research. There is a fourth metric um, that uh, is related to these that is called weighted unifrac, and that is a quantitative phylogenetic beta diversity metric, um, very similar to unweighted unifrac, but um, we're just not going to um, compute that here just for the sake of time. So you've now learned how to compute distances between pairs of samples. Um, and we did that with some examples here in cases where we had three samples or four samples in our feature table. However, it's much more common to have hundreds or maybe even thousands of samples in a feature table. And when you do that, you'll end up with distance matrices that start to look something like this. Um, this is the first few lines of a distance matrix that has about 100 samples in it. And so even that is a relatively small distance matrix. While we can look at a distance matrix like this one and make some observations. Um, so for example, we can see that um, sample uh, let's see the biggest distance we have in here is between e375 and 4gd8 the smallest distance non-zero is between 4ac2 and e357 375 so we can you know start to gain some insight about the biology from our samples by looking at this distance matrix that's not true with a bigger distance matrix like this one and so in our next lecture, what we're going to talk about is how we take something like this and use some other approaches to try and turn this into something that we can reason about and something that we can learn about our samples from. Okay, we will leave it there for today and I will see you next time.